Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Christian History and Missions on course PC201. Even before we could begin with our session, request one of us to please lead us in prayer. Brother Isaac, would you? Okay, let's pray. Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who come before you this morning, we thank you, we glorify you, we magnify your name. We thank you for giving us the opportunity to gather here this morning to take our lectures. We want to thank you for the life of our lecturers, our teachers, our schoolmates, we pray that you give us the wisdom to receive and understand our uh, subjects and to become good learners and become good conduct. That whatever we learn, Father God, can become part of us and we can use this to edify and equip others. This and all other masses we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank Amen. you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Isaac. Um, so greetings and welcome to our session on Christian history and mission. So we have been studying on various revivalists week after week. So I want to know how are these sessions impacting us individually? Our, uh, have um, each of us been blessed, but more than blessed, what is happening within us? I want to know, is there something that is changing us? Is there something that is impacting us or uh, there's a sense and urge from the Lord asking us to step out, do something for him? So I would like to hear from each of you from the class, even before we could begin. And the e-learning students, you can send your reviews in the comments or the discussion tab that has been created for you all. But for our online students, yes, you all can unmute and share uh, how the Lord is ministering to each of you within. Georgia, Leia, Anita, Jeffina, anyone, just unmute, John. Zeli, Brother Isaac, please share how the Lord is ministering to you. What's happening in your life individually? Zeli, would me. you like? Yes, okay. please go ahead. Uh, I mean, we'll go ahead with Brother Isaac. Yeah. For me, for me, I'm just marveled. At the sacrifices these revivalist uh, reformers made, you know, the, the desire to uh, expand and let the gospel be reached to all people, a selfless desire. Most of them uh, we learn about were educated and they should have engaged in other professions equally well. But God used them. So the selfless sacrifices they made is the sort of inspiration to me that at least people have done it before and there is a need that we copy from their example and try to do whatever is in our humanly possible for the development of the Christian uh, faith. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Isaac, for sharing. Uh your heart with us yeah jafina please go ahead yes pastor uh, i would love to say that uh, each and every class was such an inspiration for me it usually stirs up my desire uh, to do more for god when we study about each revivalist um, it actually gives a desire to see this revival happening, especially when you say that crime rate gets dropped. Uh, not just a change uh, in one person, but a change in a whole community, in that whole place. Uh, it really makes me stand and all. Like, uh, the, all these pubs are getting closed. The 
the whole area changes the whole environment changes because of a, a, a revival and it's not just 10 people it's a, it's more like 10000 people 20000 and lakhs and uh, i wish in my life some one day i could at least see this happening and if uh, god wills he can use me to make it so about all it really inspires me to do more for god sometimes after the class i used to go back and think what am i really doing am i really doing something for god or not and i used to uh sit back and start praying and asking god uh god take me and use me tell me what i should do for you uh so above everything i would say it really helps me to focus on god focus on my calling uh, focus on to do more for god each and every day after the class it, it really inspires me stirs my heart that i have to do something great for god and everyone had a different background everyone had a different background everyone had a different calling each revivalist they they moved in a different way and that uh, helped me to know that no matter where i am no matter what i feel on chance god can use me too and god has a purpose for me too and uh, yeah it was really inspiring each and every class uh, was inspiring and it's good to know about everything and uh, yeah getting inspired a lot getting inspired <laughs> to do more for god and that desire just keeps growing and growing and growing yeah that's what i want to say amen nice uh Thank you, Jeffina, for sharing how the Lord is moving in you. That let that inspiration become a fire that is not quenchable with time. Okay, that let allow that fire to burn within you because only when that fire, that desire burns, I'm sure you will step up like what the Lord wanted each of us to do. Let your prayer be like Isaiah asking, "Here I am, Lord. Here I'm available. Use me." And, you know, in the process, we need to see to it that, you know, we prepare our vessel, we prepare ourselves and keep ourselves ready so that in time we are ready for God to use us. Okay. So is there anyone else who would like to share? Laya, Anita, Georgia, Sally. Sally, how the Lord is uh, working in you, through you. Uh, in the place where you are, Nagaland, Kohima, would you like to share with our class? I know I get to see a lot of pictures and um, the way Lord is using you uh, among the uh, youth and the students. Would you like to share in the class? Um, personally, for me, like uh, through these uh, uh, classes, like, you know, like all the revivalists, they paid a heavy price for God. And when, like, as I was pondering, you know, like, uh, I can do much greater than them because the Holy Spirit is in me. And that really inspires me, you know, laying aside all of the challenges and obstacles, like, you know, uh, the lives of the missionaries, the great men and women of God really inspired me to press on, not to give up. Yeah, that's the thing. And by God's grace, you know, like, uh, the ministry here is going on well, you know, we see the lives of young people, the things specially impacted, and we are just so excited how the Lord is moving through our ministry, impacting the lives of the teenagers and the youths. So we are so thankful to God, and we believe, you know, uh, in the coming days also, the Lord is going to move mightily. And I, I, I believe that, uh, you know, revival will come uh, in our place also, like uh, mm -hmm. as um, we believe that, as an APC family here, we're the South and Light. So, yeah, Amen. that's the things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Zeli, for sharing. Yes, the ministry path is not easy, but then we can definitely ask God to strengthen each of us so that we don't give up. Because the scripture says the God who started is faithful enough to complete, and He is greater, much greater than us. And He will strengthen us in every area and he will lead us so we are not alone in the journey that he is faithful enough to be with us and he is always faithful yeah <clears throat> is there anyone who would like to share
yes anita please go ahead yeah thank you ma'am ma'am personally it really helpful for me to uh, know all the revivalists like how their life was how they minister to people when i was listening to when you are sharing ma'am when you are describing their stories to us in a class so i i felt like uh, it's really helpful ma'am it's like uh, one of two or three classes i cried also by listening to their stories because uh, uh many times i i feel like you know uh, here in village we uh, we are ministering to people my many people here we i think like you know i'm doing so much uh, but when i listen to these people they have done so many things they have sacrificed so many things for the lord and they have ministered to ministered in difficult areas so god is uh, just telling me to these people that uh, don't lose your hope like do uh, whatever i have asked you to do like do uh, give your best to the lord like try your best how you can uh, use uh, god's word and god's word and tell uh, you know share these people share the word to all the people around me and uh, one more thing that uh, specifically i would like to mention is uh, we are praying for uh, every thursday uh, we are praying for karwar like uh, my city here in karwar uh we are specifically praying for revival in karwar and uh, we are praying from past two years and uh, god uh, i can see that now like god is moving in karwar many people are coming Amen. to many people are uh, receiving christ as their personal savior uh, so this is like uh, god is working so we may feel like you know we are praying from past 2 3 years uh, nothing is happening we may feel like that but god is moving god is working so it's very important to pray and uh, believe uh, and god is working and uh, that's it i guess <laughs> thank you amen thank you thank you anita for sharing that yes it is very important like what anita said pray and believe we may not see it <clears throat> what we see our understanding is very limited but for sure we need to know that god is in control and god is working he has his own ways he has his own ways we cannot limit god to our time to our perspective but then we need to just believe and trust god that he is working yeah is there anyone else who would like to add success in knock and linden uh, and john we are uh, discussing on or we are sharing our experience from this class how the lord is ministering to each of us personally so i just wanted to hear from you all you all can unmute and share how the lord is uh, inspiring you or uh, working with you individually to be that revivalist to be that person you can step out of your comfort zone and minister or be that witness in the area that you are in you can unmute I'll and share. share yes please so uh, every time when we listen to the um, great movements that has happened in the history it always a reminder that god is still powerful and he can do it even today um, yeah. uh, so one of the things which uh, inspires me as uh, we listen to the class is uh to cultivate uh, the same kind of passion uh, uh, for ourselves and also for the congregation um to and to steal for more and to uh and to ask god for more um to listen to him um and to ask really for uh, for a fire to be burnt as some of us already said so it um you know it's a matter of uh, our heart and um so to cultivate that uh, desire in our heart to share um to people uh, to have that uh, desire for more of god more of revival um and and especially to have a dream uh, uh upon the place where we are ministering to uh, to see uh, in the spiritual eyes like a lot of people coming to know the lord um, many uh, nations many religious groups people groups uh, coming to know the lord the love of god to have that vision as a dream in our hearts and to really look forward and pray and intercede and work towards that amen 
Thank you. Thank you, John, for sharing that. Yes, as John shared, it is very important for us to pray in the seed and have a dream or a desire for our place that, uh, to be transformed or for God to minister in it. Yes. And he also made a very important point here is a heart attitude should be actually clear. There should be a love for people and the place. When we have that, you see, automatically there will be an earnest prayer raised from our heart. And you know, the scripture says, every earnest prayer, Lord hears it and he works. Thank you, John, so much for sharing that. Very important. Anyone else would like to add or how the Lord is ministering to you through this class? <clears throat> okay, so we will move on to our class today and continue to study on the other leaders. So let me share the presentation, even before I could begin. <clears throat> okay, today we're going to study on Sadhu Sundar Singh. How many of us have heard about him? You can just raise your hand. Okay, that's nice. That's nice. That's nice. Okay. So Sadhu Sundar Singh, a disciple of Christ, was born on September 3rd of 1889. He was an Indian Christian missionary. He is believed that he died in the foothills of Himalayas in 1929, but none of them have witnessed it. Okay, So that's why there is no exact date updated, because he just went to Tibet and then they didn't hear after that. So they believe that he must have died in that year sometime because of his health issues that he had during his last days. So let's look into him. So Sadhu Sundar Singh was born into a Punjab Sikh family in the village of Rampur near Dorha, Ludhiana district in Punjab state, uh, which is North Indian one of the North Indian state. So uh, Sundar Singh's mother took him to sit at the feet of a Hindu sadhu as an atheist, uh, sorry, not atheist, uh, uh, Hindu sadhu who was a holy man. Okay, They believe that he's a holy man and he lived in jungle some miles away while also sending him to Ewing Christian High School. So they've put him in a Christian high school at Ludhiana to learn English. So Sundar Singh's mother died when he was 14 years old in a very early age. In anger, Sundar Singh burned a Bible page by page while his friends watched him. Sundar Singh was also taught the Bhagavad Gita at his home. Later, Sundar felt his religious pursuit and the questioning of Christian priest left him without ultimate meaning. So what he did? So Sundar resolved to kill himself by throwing upon a railway track. And while he was about to commit or uh, commit suicide or kill himself, he thought, let's give himself a last chance. And then he prayed to the one true God, if he can save him. And when he prayed, or else he would kill himself. That night, when he decided that he wants to kill himself by you know, throwing himself on a, um, a railway track, he decided about uh, uh, you know, a suicidal plan for himself. And he, he slept that night. That very night in the vision, he saw Jesus. Because he asked, if there's a true God, come and show yourself to me. You see, when there's an earnest prayer made, Lord answers. 
though it is not specifically related to Jesus. He just called upon the true God and Jesus appeared to him in the vision. And later we see um, Sundar, he goes up to his father, Mr. Shur Singh, and he tells him that he has accepted Jesus as the Lord and Saviour. The minute he shared about his personal faith on Jesus, his family rejected him. And his brother Rajender Singh, he also attempted to poison Sundar Singh many times. Many times they have tried to poison him and kill him. And the people in the locality or from their custom, they have uh, uh, thrown snake into his house or into his room where he lived to kill him with a snake bite. But he was rescued supernaturally many times and by the Christian believers who lived there, the British Christian believers who lived there, who was ministering to him saved him from this mistreatment. So on his 16th birthday, he was publicly baptized as a Christian in the parish in Simla. So in uh, and, uh, in the uh, Himalayan foothills. So prior to this, he was uh, staying at the Christian missionary home at uh, uh, Sabato near Shimla, serving the leprosy patients there. So as he was learning from this uh, uh, missionary group through them, and he was also serving along with them. So in October 1906, he set out on his journey as a new Christian, wearing a saffron turban and saffron robe of a sadhu. So he changed the aesthetic look of what was uh, uh, devoted or practiced as a spiritual practice in the place where he lived. So he adapted that culture or adapted that attire over him so that he can minister to the people where he lived, where people may accept the teaching that he is sharing. So Singh started to propagate himself as Sadhu. And with that change of attire and the dress, he could minister to people in the Himalayan region where he lived in. And he also stated in one of the book, he states that, I'm not worthy to follow in the steps of my Lord, he said, but like him, I want no home, no possession. Like him, I belong to the road, sharing the suffering of my people, eating with those who will give me shelter and telling all men of the love of God. You see, he has just literally taken the great commission given by Jesus himself. So he realized what is important is the love of Christ ministering to people in the locality. Let not his dress, let not his attire, let not his food, nothing stop him from reaching the people for Christ. So that made him to change things, just like how Paul did. Paul said, I minister to Jew as a Jew, to Roman as a Roman, to Greek as a Greek. But what is important is what you teach and share to people with the Christ love within you. So after retain, returning to his own village where he was given an, a warm welcome, Sundar Singh traveled northward for his missions of convert, I mean, transforming the people in Punjab uh, and over the other places in Kashmir. Then back through um, some of the states like Afghanistan and into the brigand infected like northwest frontier of uh, Baluchistan. So he was referred formally, Sadhu Sundar Singh was referred as the apostle with the bleeding feet by the Christian communities of the North. Why? Because he suffered a lot. He suffered rest. He suffered stoning for his belief, experienced mystical encounters. You know, when we read about his uh, uh, biography and autobiographies about Sadhu Sundar Singh, we, we read about uh, different um, 
persecution that he encountered from people his path was not uh, uh, not very pleasant but then nothing stopped him just like how we read in the book of acts or in the other epistles how paul did not give up on the lord did not give up on sharing the gospel even though he was stoned to death but the next day he got up and moved to a different place to share the word why because he felt you know he felt the importance of sharing god's word he felt nothing should stop god's work you see, everyone who carried this passion, who carried the fire, nothing can quench. Even the persecution, illness, uh, the weakness of the body could not stop them from doing what God has called them to do. There was a fire, there was a passion that was continuously burning within them. So we may have to question from where did the strength come from? From where did the strength come from for Paul to uh, endure the stoning, endure the, uh, 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 the shipwreck and other persecution and how we endured to do what he did. And here we also see in Sadhu Sundar's uh, uh, Singh's life, like he encountered many persecution. He was in fact thrown into a dry well and he was there inside the dry well for three days without food and water and he was rescued supernaturally the the article just says that you know there was a rope that was put inside the well and he came out holding that rope but when he came out he, he didn't see the person who rescued him you know the lord will be with each of us to strengthen us till we complete the assignment that god has given us remember friends every call has a purpose every call that each of us have has a purpose when we are in that journey to fulfill that purpose god is with us strengthening us to fulfill that purpose we are not alone in this journey that's when even paul could say it, uh, you know in the letter to timothy the last letter he says that i have fought a good fight that means he got the sense that he has completed his purpose he has completed his journey so each of us when we have this call and a purpose each of us also have a sense within us hey there's a call there's a purpose that i need to start just like how we have the sense of call and a purpose within us to start the same way when we are in the journey we will have the sense that god is with us and not to give up that fire that passion will not be quenched will just burn every weakness will not put a full stop to our ministry but then it will only strengthen us to push us further the Lord is not only in the journey, but he will also be at the completion. When our purpose is fulfilled, he will also give us the sense that your work is completed. He will also tap your back and give you a word that good and faithful servant. You will have that sense of completion. And here you will just be ready like how Moses was ready, as how Paul was ready, as how Peter was ready. You will also be ready to meet the Lord with him. Because you know you're sensing the Lord does not do anything to us as a surprise to the children who are walking in relationship with God. We will have the sense. So we see that Sundar Singh began uh, in, his, in his ministry journey. He began a Christian ministry in the Anglican Church at Lahore. He also joined, he was part of this Anglican ministry. He joined their Bible school and uh, he studied there. While he was part of this Bible school, the missionaries there, the British missionaries who were there, they asked him to change the attire that he was wearing. But here he shared, not my attire should stop you from teaching me or ministering to me, because this is how the Lord has called me to minister to my region of people. But then the leaders there in the Anglican church could not understand and could not comprehend with the passion and zeal that he was working. But then they eventually, um, not very um, 
pleasant and allowing him to study further for which Sadhu Sundar Singh had to quit his Bible study and move on the mission work. He said, the Lord will minister to me and uh, carry the ministry that he has started in me. And with that, we see that in uh, in uh, during his 20s, Sadhu Sundar took the gospel and he went abroad. He started ministering to people across the place. And when he ministered, he saw Lord uh, Holy Spirit backing him up with signs, wonders, and miracles. He was a very humble sadhu. This is what people described about him. Despite the struggle, he didn't give up on sharing the gospel. He was a very humble man, approachable. He had the sense of love of God within him that he could minister to everyone. He lived a very ordinary life. He gave up on everything. He didn't have anything called possession for himself. He, he, had, uh, he had a great impact with the people who accepted the gospel. People said that, you know, he not only looked like Jesus, but he talks like Jesus. See, this is what the people are giving a feedback about Sadhu Sundar Singh. Imagine what Paul said in, the, uh, in his epistles. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. So what happened? What made Apostle Paul to say that? Imitate me as I imitate Christ. A greater love, a man who loved Jesus more than himself. A man who loved Jesus more than himself, he was ready to do anything for him. And we see it in his teaching and his action. Though he was stoned in one place, next day morning we see that he got up and move, moved to a different place, Derby. That's what the scripture says. He did great things for Christ. And this is what Jesus also promised. You shall do greater things than what I did in my ministry because Lord himself is with us. In the same way we see Sadhu Sundar Singh with great love, great passion, he ministered to Jesus, uh, he ministered to people about Jesus and people witnessed that, you know, people saw Jesus in him. He looked like Jesus. Just imagine how much he would have uh, uh, loved and um, dedicated himself to Jesus, that this man became like Jesus. Now tell me who on earth have, uh, during his time, have seen Jesus real? Have they heard Jesus? No, everything that we have in the media, in the paper, everywhere, is everyone, um, you know, ministering. Like how Jesus would have, in different men's perspective. But here, the sense, the Spirit of the Lord, when we minister the Spirit of the Lord who is present there, I've made them to realize this is how Jesus looks. This is how Jesus talks. The love of Christ in them has transformed him. This is what we, uh, we, uh, we study in the Gospels, like who we are in Christ is who we really are. We become Christ when we have Christ in us. So this is how Sadhu Sundar ministered to people and, uh, you know, he was called across Asia. He started traveling. He started ministering to people in different places. And during his last journey, he also moved to Tibet. He, his heart was for the people in Tibet because he wanted to reach the people who were unreached. He wanted to minister to people who have never heard about Jesus. So he started to visit Tibet on many occasions and uh, taught them about the gospel, taught them about the love of Christ. And um, yeah, um, and then even in his last journey, uh, they say that even though uh, he was very weak physically, uh, uh, many of his uh, people or his friends advised him to stay back uh, in the last days, like around 1929. They asked him to stay back and write some books and spend time there. But then his heart, his desire was not in resting. He said, um, you know, just like the other ministry leaders, he also said that I have eternity to rest but let me go to reach out for Christ 
So even though for last two years he has set out and written few books, but after that he moved out to Tibet to, uh, to share the gospel with the people there. And that was the last time that people, his friends, have witnessed him sing. But once he went to Tibet, they never heard anything about him. So in the early 1940s, Bishop Augustine Peter, another converted missionary from South India, sought out for Singh brother, Rajendra Singh. And he ministered to him and he led him to Christian faith and baptized him in Punjab. And Rajendra Singh is referred uh, as, uh, you know, he's been after Sadhu Singh, his brother took over the ministry and it said that, you know, he ministered to many other people in Punjab. The ministry continued and in his ministry, the spirit of the Lord also empowered him and they saw many signs and miracles happen there. And also we hear about his family, that his father was also accepted Christ eventually during his ministry time, for which his father also helped Sundar Singh uh, financially to travel to different places and continue the ministry that God had called him. And there are a few books that uh, Sadhu Singh has written. I would recommend you all to please read some of the books that he has written, saying that at the master's feet, with and without Christ, the real life, the real uh, re reality and religion, the search after reality, meditations on various aspects of the spiritual life. And yes, there are other books also he has written. And let me go back to the slide if I have anything. Yeah, there's some of the quotes that it's there. Uh, Sadhu Sundar Singh says that it is easy to die for Christ. It is hard to live for him. Dying takes only an hour or two. But to live for Christ means to die daily. Isn't it? There's another quote. Should I worship him from fear of hell? May I be cast into it? Or should I serve him from desire of gaining heaven? May he keep me out. But should I worship him from love alone? He reveals himself to me that may whole heart may be filled with his love and presence. So Satu Sundar Singh ministered to people with more of love in Christ. So this is some of the timeline about his journey I've listed here. Okay, yeah, we can go through it sometime. And with that, we will quickly move on to Jim Elliot. Just give me a minute. Let me go back. Yes, this is Jim Elliot with his five friends, um, Roger, Yoderian, Pete Fleming, Nate Saint, Ed Maculey. So in Jan 1956, these five mis missionaries died in an attempt to share the gospel with the Wadoni tribe in um, Ecuador. So now, 50 years later, their sacrifice has resulted in reconciliation and transformation in the tribe. So this story has inspired thousands to serve Christ. So with that, uh, we will move on. But before that, I would like to share the five missionary leaders' wife and their families here. The families here, their wife and their children. This is how they left when they died. Yeah, it's not been an easy journey for them. So on Jan 2nd, 1956 was the day, uh, you know, the 29-year-old Jim Elliot had waited for most of his life uh, to, uh, uh, <coughs> he prayed for a revival, he prayed how he can go and minister to this tribe which was unreached in this place. So he jumped out of bed, he was very excited, he dressed quickly and he went, took a short flight over this thick uh, Ecuador jungle. Almost three years of jungle ministry and many hours of planning and praying, Jim K. 
came up with a plan that he, along with his four friends, would get to this camp territory, which is very dangerous because they were uncivilized Indian tribes who were living there and they were known as Akus. And uh, they were also now known as uh, Wadoni. So Akus had killed all the outsiders ever whoever tried to enter into the area so they were very dangerous and jim elliot and other missionary four friends were aware of how these people the nature of these people were so they wanted uh, to go and minister to these people to share jesus because they didn't want them to die without knowing jesus so this is a different kind of call that each of us could have you know, we see some of the people going into the mountains like Sadhu Sundar Singh to share Jesus to the people. And now we see Jim Elliot who carries a passion. He's been having this desire along with his four friends to minister to this set of tribal people in an unreachable place. And it is no doubt that definitely it is God who has put this desire into him which was not quenchable. So as a little boy, even if you see his background, as a little boy, as he was growing up in Portland, Oregon, Jim Elliot used to listen carefully of other ministry missionaries who used to, um, you know, share the uh, uh, share their stories about the mission field or reaching out the unreached people and how people uh, uh, died in the process. You know, he was aware of all this. Despite his awareness, there's a longing desire for him to go and minister to this unreached people. So here he decides with a big plan with his four friends. On Feb 2nd, 1952, Jim Elliot, along with his other friends, waved a goodbye to his parents and everyone and boarded a ship for an 18-day trip from San Pedro, California to Quito, Ecuador, South America. He and his missionary partner, Pete Fleming, first spent a year in Kyoto learning to speak Spanish. Then they moved to Shandia, Shande, a small Quechua uh, Indian village to take the place of the retiring missionary. Jim and Pete studied hard to learn the language and fit in. So their hard work paid off in six months, both ways speaking Spanish well enough to move to Shandia. So you see, there is a hard work. There was an interest, passion. Along with that, they started moving in that direction to reach out to people in the language that they know. So when they arrived in Shandia, they also had to learn the speech of Quechua. So planning to reach the Akuas, three years later, many uh, Kunchwas had become faithful Christians. So Jim now began to feel it was time to tell the Okus about Jesus. Yeah. So three years later, Jim now began, it is ready, the time is ready to minister to Okus, and he went there. So he also learned that Okus had killed many Kunchwas. So they had also killed several workers who tried to start an oil mill company in that area, in that territory. So because of that, even the oil mill company closed down to save his people because people were very scared to go and work in that company. So they closed down. So Jim knew all this, but nothing stopped him. He wanted Akuas uh, to know Jesus so that they may stop killing people. His aim was Akuas to know and uh, experience the love of Christ, then they may experience uh, so that they may stop doing what they're doing. So Jim and the four other others, um, Ecuador missionaries, began to plan a way to show the Okus they were friendly. So Nate Saint, one of his friend, a missionary supply. Let me change the slide to. Uh, 
give me a minute to the name so that when we call out the names of people, we would understand who exactly they are. Yeah, Nate Saint. So we all can see Nate Saint, right? Yeah, he was a missionary, supply pilot, came up with a way to lower a bucket filled with supplies to the people on the ground while flying above them. So he thought this would be a perfect way to win the trust of Hokus without putting any of us in danger. So they began to drop gifts to Okus. They also used an amplifier to speak out in friendly Okus praise. So after many months, the Okus even sent a gift back in the bucket to the plane. So Jim and other missionaries felt this is the right time for us to meet with them face to face. And one day while flying over that territory, Nate Saint spotted a beach that looked long enough to land the plane. And he planned to land there. And the men would build a tree house to stay safe until friendly contact they could make with these people. So the missionaries were um, uh, flying one by one and dropped off on that beach. So Nate Saint then flew over the Akua village and called for Okus to come to the beach. After four days, an Oko man and two women appeared. So it was easy for them, for them to understand and uh, speak to each other uh, with some Oko phrases that they learned and shared a meal with them. So Nate uh, took the man up for a flight ride and they were very friendly. So the missionaries tried to show sincere love and friendship with these people. So next two days, the missionaries waited for the other people to come, fathers to come. So finally, on the sixth day, there were two Akua women who came close to them out of the jungle. But as they reached closer, the facial appearance were not very friendly. The minute uh, 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 they realized it, the appearance was not very friendly. Jim and P, uh, uh, Pete almost immediately heard a terrifying cry behind them. And when they turned, they saw a group of Oku's warrior. They came there with a spear and rushed and raised and, uh, you know, um, ready to kill each one of them within no time all five were pierced with the arrow. But the point here is, even before they could be pierced with the arrow, Jim Elliot reached the gun. He had the gun in his pocket, and he had to decide instantly if he would want to kill any of these uh, Okus to save themselves. But then he decided not to kill any of these Okus because they did not know Jesus themselves. You know, at that point, I think he would have thought, what would Jesus do? He just demonstrated the love of God there. He had the option to save himself. But then he had also, but he chose the option of demonstrating Christ's love by giving himself for his friend. This is what the scripture says. A good friend is the one who lays down his life for his friend. Jesus laid down his life voluntarily to each of us to redeem us. We see Jim Elliot and his friends just showed that love of Christ to this set of group. They just killed at the spear. And all the missionaries, Ed McLee, Rog uh, Uderin, Nate Saint, Pete Fleming, and Jim Elliot was killed there. Lately in the afternoon, that Sunday, Jan 8th, Elizabeth Elliot, Jim Elliot's wife, waited for the two-way radio to hear from them. But because they didn't hear, she had to keep the missionary team updated. And next morning, another missionary pilot flew over the beach to look out for the men. And he saw only badly damaged plane on the beach. News quickly spread around the world uh, and uh, about these five missionaries and the United, uh, United, uh, United States search team went to the beach, found the missionary bodies and they buried them. But, this, but let's not think that um, 
this Oku's operation ended there. In less than two years, Elizabeth Elliot, Jim Elliot's wife, along with their daughter Valerie and Rachel Singh, that is Nate's sister, were able to move to these Oku's village. Now, many Okus became Christian after that. They are now a friendly tribe. Missionaries, including the Nate Saint's son and his family, still live among the Okus today. To know more, I would recommend you guys to please watch the movie. Uh, movie and read a book on Jim Elliot, movie uh, known as End of Spear. It's available on YouTube. Y'all can download and watch. What happened? Elizabeth Elliot even helped to make a movie. Uh, she made a movie on about Operation Akua through the gates of splendor. It showed real life scenes of the five missionaries on the beach with the friendly Okus. Let me repeat the name of the movie, Operation Okua. Let me post this in the chat. Or there's another movie called The End of Spear. So you can watch this. So we exactly will understand how they try to minister to the people, how they brought one tribal girl from the tribe, trained her, learned the language, trained her to in speak in English. And then they sent her into the tribe. And, you know, through her, they started ministering. And then finally, Jim Elliot's wife, along with the others, joined the people. They ministered to them. And you see, they shared the love of Christ. There were forgiveness in their heart. There was no vengeance. And also, uh, there, there are a few quotes that I would like to share about Jim Elliot, which became very famous. It is, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. So let's ask ourselves. As the time is running, I'll end the session with this. Let's make it real and ask a few questions. Like Jim desire to serve God as a missionary. Unlike Jim, even we desire to serve God as a missionary. But how do we desire to serve God? Do we have some limitations? We need to ask ourselves, Lord, help me to serve you wholeheartedly. Prepare me, prepare my family. What made Elizabeth to step up after her husband to the same tribal people to minister. We also see Jim chose not to use a gun to protect himself when attacked by these Okus. Why did he do that? What would we have done in this place? What would each of us do in this place? Can we be like Elizabeth and Valerie to go live among the tribal people, still to minister? We need to ask God. We need to ask ourselves and ask God, God, strengthen us. Strengthen our heart, strengthen our mind. That we may be ready to serve you the purpose that you have called each of us. Let's pray. Dear God, Father, we surrender and submit each of us from this class, and later we will also be listening to the session of other. Lord, we pray that every call has a purpose. Every purpose has a beginning and has a hand. Lord, we pray that you will be with us. You know our end from the beginning. Lord, I pray that you will strengthen us, strengthen our hearts, strengthen our mind, strengthen our hands to do what you have called to do. Help us to have that burning desire within us, Lord, just like how the desire that you put in each of the apostles, the desire that you yourself carried, Lord, 
to do and complete the Father's will. Father, we pray for your spirit to minister to each of us. Let that desire, let that passion burn within us, Lord, to do what you have called us to do, to fulfill the purpose that you have called each of us, Lord. Father, we believe, yes, Lord, that we are not alone in this journey, but you are with us. You are leading us. You are guiding us. You are upholding us, oh, Father. Thank you for your strength in us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining in today's session. God bless. Continue to meditate, continue to ponder, continue to write and pray. Ask God to lead you in each and every way. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless. See you all in the next session. Thank you.